Before I start my talk, we seek the protection of Allah from the shaitan who has been expelled from God's kingdom of extra mercy because of his arrogance, of his defiance of God's law, and because of his rebellion. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. As we plan and we intend to achieve some goodness and some guidance from this discussion, we pray to Allah because of three reasons. Number one, because He is the absolute perfect being. And therefore any perfection, any goodness, any virtue that will materialize in this world necessarily has to originate from him and him alone, though it may reach us through a variety of channels and medium. And secondly, we seek his help and his guidance because he is Rahman. His Rahma, his love, his mercy, it reaches out to each and every one of us. It brings us into existence, it maintains us, sustains us, provides us, with all that is necessary for our existence and development. And finally, we seek his guidance and his help because he is Rahim, his extra love, his continuous mercy, his abundant grace is available to those amongst us who admit to his existence and then who submit to his will. والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا ونبينا محمد وآله الطاهرين. And we send our salutations and greetings and our profound expression of love and loyalty to the Holy Prophet of Islam. Because he is the most perfect human being Allah has created for two reasons. Number one, his understanding, his comprehension of who God is, of what God's attributes are, of what God's actions and governing of the universe is. His comprehension was the maximum possible for any human being. And secondly, he's the most perfect man because he was absolute and total in his surrender and his submission to the will of God in all aspects of his life, be it private or public, be it physical or emotional or spiritual. And we send our expressions of love and loyalty to his holy progeny who were his equivalents but who were secondary to him. And especially so on the third holy Imam, the one who sacrificed his life in a manner which was unique in the history of mankind, thereby enabling him to become the role model for all, for all movements and all uprisings to establish divine justice on the earth. Elders in Islam, brethren in Islam, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. It is a tradition that in the month of Muharram, we, the followers of Ahlul Bayt, assemble and recollect and remind ourselves of the virtues of the Ahlul Bayt, especially so of Imam Hussein and his band of followers. I, I always prefer in the beginning to remind myself and ourselves of the purpose why we gather here so that the tone is set then to maximize the benefit of holding such gatherings. We may have heard this before and I may have mentioned it elsewhere but it behooves repetition and reminding ourselves and recollecting the purpose. It's amazing if you look at the traditions which our holy Imams have handed down to us 
about the necessity and the importance of holding such gatherings. If you look at the major collections of the Shia Hadith books, for example, Wasail al-Shia, or before that, Bihar al-Anwar of Marhum Allama Majlisi, you'll find a huge number of Hadith pertaining to this particular subject. <coughs> I wish to remind ourselves of some of those Hadith, and then we try to analyze them and see the purpose why the Imams insisted we should hold such gatherings. Majlisi, may Allah bless his soul in Barzakh, in chapter 44 of his 110 volume of Bihar al-Anwar, discusses the tragedy and the history of Karbala. In the beginning of that history, he then quotes the traditions pertaining to the virtues and the excellence and the necessity of weeping and lamenting and mourning for Imam Hussein alayhi salam. There are almost about 38 traditions. If you remove those traditions which are repetitive, the seven or eight major themes that one can then derive from this collection are as follows. Note, there's one tradition which says that كُلُّ الْجَزَعِ وَالْبُكَاءِ مَكْرُوهٌ Every form of weeping and lamentation publicly is to be discouraged for our personal grief and personal losses. More than three days of weeping generally is discouraged in the riwayat. إِلَّا الْجَزَعَ وَالْبُكَاءَ عَلَى الْحُسَيْنَ عَلَيْهِ السَّلَامِ Except for one particular lamentation and weeping and mourning and expression of grief, and that is for Imam Hussein alayhi salam. Note the recommendation of weeping. Two, Fudayl reports from the sixth holy Imam that the Imam inquired from him, Tajlisuna wa tatahaddathun. Do you deliberately organize gatherings where you sit and try to remind yourselves about our virtues? Fudayl says, Naam ju'il tu fidak. May I be ransomed for you, O Imam. Of course, we do hold such gatherings. Imam then praises him for such an act. Inna tilka al-majalisa uhibbuha. Yes. Such gatherings are to be recommended, like the ones we're having now. فَأَحْيُوا amrana, Sit and try to remind yourselves of the virtues of Ahlul Bayt. Ya Fudayl, رَحِمَ اللَّهِ مَنْ أَحْيَا amrana. May Allah grant His special grace and favor to those who assemble and remember the virtues of these holy role models. And then Imam mentions one specific reward for such gatherings. Ya Fudayl, man dhakarana, whosoever gathers and remembers us, aw dhukirna indahu, or somebody else mentions our virtues. Fakharaja min aynihi, mithlu janahi dhubab. And then after remembering our suffering, even one drop of tear comes out as small as the wing of a fly, then the effect is غفر الله له ذنوبه Allah forgives all his sins. وَلَوْ كَانَتْ أَكْثَرَ مِنْ زَبَدِ الْبَحْرِ Even, even if the quantity of the sins is so large as the froth of the seas, Note, not only is lamentation and weeping recommended, lamentation and weeping is rewarded specifically by its redemptive effect. It redeems, it enables us to deserve our sins to be forgiven. Number two, <coughs> in the same category, there are other traditions which say that not only the quantity of sins are forgiven, even the quality of sins are forgiven. 
فعلى مثل الحسين فليبكي الباكون let those who do want to weep and lament do so on Imam Hussein فإن البكاء عليه يحط الذنوب العظام surely lamentation and weeping for Imam Hussein enables that individual to get his major sins to be forgiven yet a third tradition in the same category which talks about the quality and the quantity of sins to be forgiven the eighth holy imam tells Shab Rayan Rayan bin Shabib was a relative of Ma'mun he came to the presence of the eighth holy imam in the month of Muharram there's a long tradition I just quote one particular passage where the imam tells him Yabn <laughs> al-Shabib in Bakayta al Hussein, if you ever cried for the Holy Imam, Hatta Tasira Dumu Aka Ala Khaddaik, till your tears flow on your cheeks, Ghafar Allahu Laka, Kulla Thambin Adnabtahu, Sagiran Kana Au Kabiran, Kali Lankana Au Kathiran. All your sins, all of them will be forgiven. Be they small, be they major, be they few, be they abundant and plenty. All sins. Amazing. Not only is such a gathering to be recommended, there is a redemptive effect in this gathering. Number three. Yet another tradition says, Man dhukirna indahu, whosoever hears our grief, our suffering, and then he cries for us, Harramallahu wajjahahu ala nar. Not only are sins forgiven, but Allah prohibits and restricts him from the torment and the punishment of the fire of hell. Not only is such a gathering to be recommended, not only does it have a redemptive effect, it also has a restrictive effect. It rescues us from the fire of hell. We need to ask ourselves how and why. Number four, the tradition narrated from the eighth holy Imam, Man dhukkira bi musabina, whosoever hears our grief, fabaka aw abka, and then he cries or he makes others cry, irrespective. Lam tabki aynuhu yawma tabki l'uyun. On the day of judgment, when others will grieve, he will rejoice. Not only is such a gathering to be recommended, not only does it have a redemptive effect, not only does it rescue us from the fire of hell, it affords us to rejoice on the day when people will regret the loss they made in the dunya. Four. Five. A category of tradition which says that man jalasa majlisan yuhya fihi amruna whosoever participates in a gathering where our suffering is discussed, our virtues are promulgated. Lam yamut qalbuhu yawma tamutul qulub. His heart shall not die on the day when other hearts will be dead. What sort of a heart would be dead? Perhaps the one which is indicated in Surah A'raf chapter 7, ayah number 170 where Allah says, There's a category of people who have eyes but cannot see the truth that is. Who have ears but cannot hear the truth that is. Who have hearts but cannot comprehend the truth that is. The example of such a people is just like cattle. The cattle have no responsibility but because they were never given the faculty and the ability to perceive the truth. This individual was granted and bestowed that supreme virtue and gift by God to be able to listen or look or think about the truth, to understand it and to respond to it by accepting it. Yet he rejected it and therefore he's worse than the animal. Not only do such gatherings have a recommendation, not only do they have 
a restrictive effect on our future from the fire of hell. It rescues us. Not only will it afford us to rejoice on the day of judgment, it will also revive our hearts on that day. No. Traditions go beyond this. <coughs> the fifth holy imam narrates one sentence which he says, my father, the fourth holy imam, used to repeat often, Kana Ali ibn al Hussein, Yaqul ayyuma mu'minin, whichever believer, Dama'at aynahu, cries, Liqatl al Hussein alayhi salam, for the massacre that was suffered by Imam Hussein and his followers. حَتَّى تَسِيلَ عَلَى خَدِّهِ And tears flow on his cheeks. بَوَّأَهُ اللَّهُ بِهَا فِي الْجَنَّةِ غُرَفًا Allah will cause him to enter paradise. Allah will resurrect him in the company of the Holy Prophet and the Holy Imams. Such a gathering is to be recommended. One, such a gathering has a rescuing effect from the fire of hell. Two, such a gathering is redemptive of our sins. Three, it will give us an opportunity to rejoice on the day when other hearts shall grieve for the losses in the dunya. Four, not only that, it will revive our hearts when other hearts are dead on the day of judgment. Five, no, it will resurrect us in the company of the Holy Prophet 6. No, there's a seventh effect that's mentioned in the tradition, and that is <coughs> coming back to the tradition of Shab Ibn Shabib from the 8th Holy Imam. Ya Ibn Shabib, in sarraka an takuna ma'ana fid darajatil ula fil jinani fahzan li huznina wa frah li farahina. O oh, son of Shabib, Rayyan, if you so wish, if you aspire, if your desire is so high and lofty that you want to be not only with us on the Day of Judgment, not only in paradise, but also in our company in the higher echelons of paradise, then grieve in our grief and rejoice on the occasions where, when we rejoice. So not only are such gatherings to be recommended. Not only the such gatherings are redemptive of our sins, major or minor, plenty or few, not only are such gatherings restrictive on us from the fire of hell, not only do they afford us the opportunity to rejoice, not only do they revive our hearts, such gatherings also afford us to enter paradise. No. It enables us to raise ourselves to the highest levels in paradise. No. There's one effect of these gatherings that is beyond any record, any, any possibility to register. The hadith states, لِكُلِّ شَيْءٍ سِرٌ Oh, sorry. لِكُلِّ سِرٍ ثَوَابٌ إِلَّا الدَّمْعَةَ فِينَا for every act of goodness, for every act of virtue, Allah has promised a specific reward, except for one. And that is lamentation and weeping on Imam Hussein alayhi salam. Not only are such gatherings a means whereby we can get our sins redeemed, not only are such gatherings means whereby we rescue ourselves from the fire of hell not only that we rejoice not only that our hearts are revived not only that we re we get resurrected with the holy family in jannah no we raise ourselves to the higher stations no we enable ourselves to qualify for a degree of reward which cannot be recorded or registered indeed Notice in the Quran, when the promise of reward is made for Jannah, 
there's one particular reward that's mentioned. For example, in Surah says the chapter 32, ayah number 17. فَلَا تَعْلَمُ نَفْسٌ مَا مِنْ كَانُوا يَعْمَلُونَ No nafs, no nafs can even fathom and comprehend and understand the enormity and the profundity of the pleasure and the bliss which Allah has promised for some people. Yet in another ayah, for example, in Surah Qaf, chapter 50, ayah number 35, Allah says, لَهُمْ فِيهَا مَا يَشَاءُونَ In Jannah, there is one degree of reward whereby every individual shall be able to obtain and to attain whatever he wills. He becomes almost godlike. God says, كُنْ فَيَكُونَ The reward for certain individuals in Jannah is they also get to that station of being able to will into existence whatever they wish. No. Allah goes well beyond that. Lahum fiha ma yasha una waladayna mazid. And we have even power to provide beyond that. Essentially, in the dunya, because of the restrictions of time and limitations of space and the constraints of the four physical forces of maybe gravity or light or any of these physical laws many a times our will cannot be enacted not that God's mercy is restrictive true God's wisdom requires the universe should be governed under specific laws but that same wisdom and that same mercy manifests itself on the day of judgment by creating a phase of existence, a realm of being, a state of life whereby the mercy of God manifests itself in its full force whereby the reward then is not only being saved from the fire of hell. Oh, even sick people, mentally sick people won't be punished in the fire of hell. That's not a great deal, not to go to hell. Where the mercy of God will not only manifest itself by salvation from the fire of hell. Where the mercy of God will not only manifest itself by gaining entry into Jannah. Where the mercy of God will not only express itself by rising to the highest levels in Jannah. No, there is a level of the expression, the fullest expression. Of the mercy, of the love, of the grace, of the bliss of God, which we can never even imagine or comprehend or fathom in this world today. And one of the ways, one of the ways, this is not the only way, one of the best ways to be able to achieve that status is to participate in these gatherings of weeping and lamentation. Question. We've been participating in gatherings since childhood. How come we never experience in ourselves such tremendous transformative effects which these traditions promise? In fact, there are some scholars. I quoted from Biharul Anwar. There is one commentator. He writes his glosses in the footnote. He says, you know, don't tell me that a sinner, a criminal, a person who is habituated to a wrong lifestyle can just come and sit in a gathering, shed a few tears, and then deserve to receive all this tremendous reward. No way. Perhaps, now he's trying to interpret why tremendous and enormous degree of reward has been promised for such gatherings. Perhaps... You know, there was a time in the history of the Ahlul Bayt whereby people were restricted from expressing grief and visiting the grave and they were persecuted and they were oppressed during those circumstances when the expression of the loyalty and love to Ahlul Bayt becomes an arduous, laborious task, almost like jihad, then the reward is so great. Not today when we're sitting in the comfort 
of these institutions that we have set up. Seems a logical interpretation. But allow me to suggest another explanation for the reason why such a tremendous degree of reward is promised. The purpose being, if we understand and appreciate why such a reward has been promised, then it would enable us then to develop that right attitude and frame of mind whereby we can then maximize the benefit from attending and participating in such gatherings. Our great scholars say that generally whenever you receive a tradition from the holy Imams, the process of authentication requires three steps to be taken. Number one, the character of the narrators of those traditions has to be assessed and evaluated. Sometimes you find that due to some historical reasons there were some fabrications and concoctions of hadith introduced into the vast body and of, of hadith literature that we have received from the holy imams. So step number one. When there is a possibility, and surely there was in history, this terrible crime of fabrication, the first step then is evaluate and assess critically the character of the narrator who brings the hadith to you. Incidentally, the scholars who have analyzed the character of the narrators of such traditions find that these traditions are either highly authentic or moderately authentic or some are weakly authentic. There are some weak traditions. However, overall, because most of them uh, share certain common themes, the bottom line, the common denominator of these traditions is that there is a great, enormous amount of reward promised for such gatherings. Step number one, character. Step number two, circumstances. Sometimes the Imam may express a hadith contrary to his true intention because of the circumstances whereby maybe the expression of the truth will be harmful. But the same Imam on other occasions has clarified the truth. On this particular occasion, he tells, for example, Ali ibn Yaqteen, go and make wudu in a particular way, for example. So step number two, not the circumstances in which the traditions were expressed have to be evaluated. And thirdly, most important, the content. The content of the hadith has to be analyzed. Not only the character of the narrator, not only the circumstances of the expression of the hadith, but the content of the hadith. The single most important criterion for the evaluation of the authenticity of a tradition is its conformity with the Quran. Recall the Imams themselves tell us if you receive a tradition from us, which is contradictory to what the Quran says, then A, it's false. B, it is fabricated. C, throw it on the wall. D, we never say it. One way to establish and to ascertain the authenticity of a tradition is to judge its conformity its consonance, its agreement with the themes mentioned in the Quran. Question, what does the Quran say about the qualification to enter Jannah? Is it merely crying that qualifies a person to deserve to enter Jannah? Allow me to remind ourselves of some of the qualifications mentioned in the Quran that that enables us to qualify to enter Jannah. For example, the famous ayah which says that those who have Iman and those who perform Amal Salih, they are the ones who will go to Jannah. One. Two. <coughs> in Surah Maryam, and there are many ayat in the Quran of this particular theme. 
Second qualification, taqwa. For example, Surah Maryam, chapter 19, ayah number 63. Allah says, Tilka al-jannah allati nurithu min ibadina man kana taqiyya. That lofty station of paradise where the full expression of God's mercy and bliss and grace will manifest itself, that station of paradise will be inherited, will be bequeathed to those who have taqwa. Taqwa meaning God consciousness. Taqwa meaning awareness of the presence of the all-wise God. Therefore, I would be foolish to follow my own desires. Taqwa implies the recognition of the all-loving Lord, therefore I would be misguided if I thought by following my own desires I will be able to achieve my own interests because God who loves me more than I can ever love myself, if I then follow Him and His commands, <coughs> that is taqwa. A qualification number three. Mentioned in the Quran for entering Jannah. Obedience. Obedience to God. Surah Nisa, chapter 4, ayah number 13. Allah says, وَمَن يُطِعِ اللَّهَ وَرَسُولَهُ يُدْخِلْهُمْ جَنَّاتٍ تَجْرِي مِنْ تَحْتِهَا الْأَنْهَارِ خَالِدِينَ فِيهَا وَذَلِكَ هُوَ الْفَوْزُ الْعَظِيمُ Whosoever submits his will and obeys Allah, and obeys the Holy Prophet, qualifies to deserve to enter Jannah. Yet a fourth qualification, righteousness. To be righteous in our belief, in our ABCs, in our actions, to be true in our actions, in our speech, <coughs> to be true in our beliefs, to be true and righteous in our character, Siddiq. In the Quran, for example, in Surah Ma'idah, chapter 5, toward the end, Allah says, Yawma yanfa'u There will be a group of people who shall enjoy the reward of God for having led a righteous life. Chapter 5, Surah Ma'idah. Towards the end, ayah number 119, Allah says, This is the day when the righteous shall enjoy the fruits of their truthfulness in the, on the earth. <coughs> How? For them is paradise. God consciousness, taqwa. Obedience to the will of God too. Righteousness, three. Fear of God, no. Awareness of the presence and feeling a sense of awe and humility in front of the absolute majesty of God. A qualification for Jannah. Surah Rahman, chapter 55. Allah says, وَلِمَنْ خَافَ مَقَامَ رَبِّهِ جَنَّتَانِ فَبِأَيِّ آلَاءِ رَبِّكُمَا تُكَذِّبَانِ Whosoever experiences this state of awe, of awareness of the majesty of his Lord, and therefore humility and respect to that majesty, for such a person is Jannah. Five. The ability to control desires. وَمَنْ خَافَ مَقَامَ رَبِّهِ سُورَ نَازِعَاتِ وَنَّهَا النَّفْسَ عَنِ الْهَوَى And then controls and subjugates his desire to the will of God. For such people there is Jannah. فَإِنَّ الْجَنَّةَ هِيَ الْمَأْوَى Six. Hijrah. Immigration, or emigration rather, from an environment where the circumstances do not permit you to express your obedience to the will of God, as was done by the early Muslims. In Surah Tawbah, for example, chapter 9, 
I number 20. Alladhina amanu. Those who believe. They've seen the Prophet. They've witnessed his miracles. <coughs> they've controlled their desires and accepted the truth. Alladhina amanu. Wahajaru. And then, because they could not practice the true faith, they abandon their family, their friends, their whole life. They abandon it. They make the hijrah. وَجَاهَدُوا فِي سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ بِأَمْوَالِهِمْ وَأَنفُسِهِمْ And then they strive and they struggle and they sacrifice their possessions and they sacrifice, no, even their lives for the sake of God. For such people, يُبَشِّرُهُمْ رَبُّهُمْ بِرَحْمَةٍ مِّنْهُ Allah gives them the promise of a specific mercy which we, we cannot comprehend here. One. Two. وَرِضْوَانٍ And that supreme pleasure of being accepted by God, the master of the universe, who has the control over each and every particle in the universe. That master of the universe is satisfied with you. He has accepted you. You are a special servant. That is a reward. Two, three. وَجَنَّاتٍ لَهُمْ فِيهَا نَعِيمٌ مُقِيمٌ And the gardens of paradise where the pleasures and the blessings are permanent, are profound, and are pure. Notice, the reward is promised for hijrah. The reward is promised for jihad. No. Yet another qualification for entering Jannah is dying in the way of God. Martyrdom. Surah Tawbah, chapter 9. I number 111. In Allah ashtara min al mu'minin anfusahum wa amwalahum bi anna lahumul jannah. Allah has purchased, has accepted <coughs> the merchandise of a believer's possessions, of a believer's personhood. If he sells himself and his possessions to God, and God purchases it from him, then the price that God pays back is Jannah. Amazing, amazing tone and manner of encouragement. Imagine if you have a whole garden, and you are the provider of all the bounties, and you bring a slave, Everything the slave owns is, gr is granted by you, the master. <coughs> you tell him, plant the roses. You enable the seeds to be brought. You enable the water. You have brought, bought the land. It's all your possession. Yet this worker only plants the seeds and the rose grows. And then you tell him, if you present a rose to me as a gift, then I will grant you this garden. Allah buys and purchases from the believers their possessions, which is God granted, their personhood, which is God granted, and the price he pays back is Jannah. Yet another qualification for Jannah is sincerity, ikhlas, as mentioned in Surah Safat. Yet another qualification for Jannah is steadfastness, to be committed and dedicated to the way of God and not to waver. As, for example, mentioned in Surah Fussalat, chapter 41. <laughs> Amongst the people and believers are those who express their belief in God and then they remain committed to it. They don't waver. For them, Allah promises, تَتَدَزَّلُ عَلَيْهِمُ الْمَلَائِكَ أَلَّا تَخَافُوا وَلَا تَحْزَنُوا وَأَبْشِرُوا بِالْجَنَّةِ Steadfastness. Salah. Salah is another act of worship for which Allah promises Jannah. For example, in Surah Ma'arij, chapter 70, beginning from ayah number 15 onward till ayah, sorry, ayah number 20 up till ayah number 35, there's a description of almost about <coughs> seven to eight qualities 
at the end of which Allah promises Jannah. But the first quality and the last quality is Salah. خُلِقَ الْإِنسَانُ A human being who has not been disciplined by the revelation of God and the teachings of God, he is hasty in life. إِذَا مَسَّهُ الْخَيْرُ مَنُوعًا If God grants him blessings and bounties, he doesn't want to share. He wants to enjoy it himself. وَإِذَا مَسَّهُ الشَّرُّ جَزُوعًا When he's afflicted with suffering, he complains. He doesn't have the ability to persevere. إِلَّا الْمُصَلِّينَ Except for those who are in constant communication with their Creator. الَّذِينَ هُمْ عَلَى صَلَاتِهِمْ دَائِمُونَ Those who are in constant communication with their Creator. And therefore, constant reminder that whatever they are, and whatever they have, and whatever they will ever have or lose is by God's will. And that affords them a degree of satisfaction and contentment. And then it lists down several qualities towards the end. وَالَّذِينَ هُمْ عَلَىٰ صَلَاتِهِمْ يُحَافِظُونَ There are those who preserve their salah, who observe all the rules pertaining to their salah. For such people, there is Jannah. The list of the qualifications that would deserve an individual to enter Jannah in the Quran is long. In short, awareness and humility before God, obedience to the will of God, righteousness in all our actions, beliefs, and character. Resistance and determination in the way of God. Four, being kind and benevolent to others. Five, being ready to die for the sake of God. Six, emigration in the way of God. Seven, steadfastness and resolution and commitment and dedication in the way of God. Eight, Sincerity, nine. The constant remembrance and engagement in prayer with God, ten. And the list goes on. In summary, the best ayah is the one which says that the person who will enter into Jannah will be the one with Iman and the one with Amal Salih. Having understood this from the Quran, let's get back to the Hadith. The one that promises tremendous reward including entering into Jannah it means that the remembrance of Imam Hussein should somehow strengthen our Iman and Amal Salih in such a way that it would then inspire us, it would encourage us to move toward that degree of constant communication with God and remembrance of God and righteousness and sincerity and readiness to sacrifice and to emigrate in, this, in the way of God. Basically, to be ready at the end of the day to die for the sake of God. If these feelings and sentiments are invoked, are induced, are generated in us, after listening to Karbala, yes, there is the reward of Jannah. Otherwise, otherwise, the enemies of Imam Hussein also did cry for him. There is no Jannah for them. In conclusion, the tremendous degree of reward that's promised for lamentation and weeping, which is recommended, which is redeeming and redemptive of our sins, which then rescues us from the fire of hell, which enables us to rejoice on the day when others will regret, which revives and rejuvenates our heart when other hearts will be dead, which resurrects us in the company of the Prophet. No, which raises us to the highest stations in Jannah. No, which enables us to deserve a degree of reward which cannot even be recorded or registered. All that, all that is predicated on us asking ourselves as we listen to Imam Hussein's tragedy and we cry and we sympathize 
Do we identify with his values? Do we imbibe them? Do we integrate them in our lives? Does that bring us a change in our faith, in our amal of salih, in those 10 qualifications which the Quran has mentioned? If yes, then surely Allah of his mercy does grant that great reward. Let's pray to Allah to give us the tawfiq to enable us to achieve this lofty and noble goal. You have already heard in the past session that Imam Hussein alayhi salam, after receiving the news of the death of Muawiyah, was then confronted with the choice of expressing allegiance to Yazid. One of the primary reasons why the whole tragedy of Karbala took place was because of that allegiance that was imposed on Imam Hussein alayhi salam. Response of Imam, very clear. He tells Walid, <coughs> Inna ahlu nubuwa. You know, we belong to the family of prophethood. The values of purity, of goodness, of virtue is in our flesh and blood. One. We are the treasure house of Risala. Risala meaning the propagation of godly values in society. Three. We are so pure that every moment angels descend on our hearts and bring us the good news and the inspiration from the all-perfect being. Three. And angels also are, are under our will, whereby, by God's permission, we can even control the governance of the universe. Bina Fatahullah wa bina yakhtim. Allah begins the process of governing the universe by manifesting His will through our will. Because our wills are in total submission to the will of God. And <coughs> Allah ends the purpose, the purpose of the governance of the universe is related to our existence. Amazing statement Imam Hussein makes. And therefore, it's inconceivable for this degree of purity and perfection then to bow down and to subjugate itself and to degrade itself to the control of a person. Well, Yazid, Fasiqun, Sharibul Khamri, Mu'linun Bil Fisqi, Qatilun Nafsil Muharrama. He doesn't have any respect for property or for people. It's him and his passions. Such a ruler can never be allowed to then dictate to the household of the Prophet. وَمِثْلِي لَا يُبَايِعْ مِثْلَهِ Never ever will I submit myself to him. When he leaves Medina, history records that Imam Hussein salam left behind a will with Muhammad Hanafiya. A will that summarizes the purpose of his movement and his uprising. هَذَا مَا أَوْصَى بِهِ حُسَيْنُ بْنُ عَلِي إِلَىٰ أَخِيهِ مُحَمَّدَ الْمَعْرُوفِ بِإِبْنِ الْحَنَفِيَّةِ This is the will that is left behind by Hussein to Muhammad, who is known as Ibn Hanafiyya. إِنَّ الْحُسَيْنَ يَشْهَدُ أَنَّهُ لَا إِلَاهَ إِلَّا اللَّهِ وَحْدَهُ لَا شَرِيكَ لَهُ Let the world know that Hussein testifies and witnesses that there is no power in the universe that deserves to be recognized, to be accepted, to be believed, to be followed, to be loved, to be praised, to be thanked other than Allah. Not Yazid, never ever. وَأَنَّ مُحَمَّدًا عَبْدُهُ وَرَسُولُهُ جَاءَ بِالْحَقِّ مِنْ عِنْدِ الْحَقِّ And I fully accept that the Prophet is the total, absolute servant of God in all his aspects of life. And therefore the messenger who brought the truth from the absolute source of truth. Two. Three. 
and Hussein witnesses وأن الجنة حق والنار حق وأن الساعة آتية لا ريب فيها وأن الله يبعث من في القبور and Hussein testifies that paradise is a reality so great that it now possesses peoples of purity they strive for it fire of hell is so profound a reality that the people of truth and purity are possessed and consumed by that reality to an extent that they're ready to fast for three days and then share their iftar with the yasi with the asir and the yatim and the miskeen if you look at that surah one of the reasons for this act of sacrifice is the fear of the fire of hell and hussein believes that surely the hour of reckoning will come absolutely there is no doubt in it and surely we will be, br be brought back to life don't you ever say, therefore, question, why does Hussein, alayhi salam, may Allah's blessings be on this holy warrior who sacrificed all he had for the sake of Allah. Why did he go through these steps of declaring his faith? Don't you ever say later on, oh, you know, he was an apostate. He was a rebel. He had to be eliminated. His statement is very clear of what his faith was. إِنِّي لَمْ أَخْرُجْ أَشِرًا وَلَا بَطِرًا وَلَا مُفْسِدًا وَلَا ظَالِمًا Don't you ever say that my uprising is for some prophet seeking or so for some pleasure seeking or to cause chaos and corruption. إِنَّمَا خَرَجْتُ لِطَلَبِ الْإِصْلَاحِ فِي أُمَّةِ جَدِّي أُرِيدُ أَنْ آمُرَ بِالْمَعْرُوفِ وَأَنْهَا عَنِ الْمُنْكَرِ وَأَنْ أَسِيرَ بِسِيرَةِ جَدِّي وَأَبِي عَلِي بْنَ أَبِي طَالِبٍ Three major reasons why I am undertaking this movement and uprising in opposition to Yazid. Number one, I want to reform the Ummah. It's deviated. It's deviated in its economics, in its politics, in its social life. We need to discuss this a little de uh, more in detail later. Secondly, I wish to establish virtue in the society. Virtue has been eliminated. I wish to eliminate vice. Vice is being practiced in our society. And number three, I wish to reintroduce <coughs> and to retrace the path and the lifestyle of my grandfather, which has been abandoned. And especially the lifestyle and the path of my father Ali, the son of Abu Talib. Ajib, Imam Hussein emphasizes this particular aspect. You have now two choices. Either you select or you reject. If you select to follow my path, Allah will reward you. If you decide to reject, then remember, I will persevere <coughs> and continue on this path and Allah will judge between us and you on the day of judgment amazing statement <coughs> of belief he reaches Mecca he leaves Medina towards the end of Rajab reaches Medina on the third of Sha'ban uh, sorry reaches Mecca on the third of Sha'ban he stays in Mecca up till the eighth of the Hajj when people on the day of Tarwiyah then prepare for the Ihram of Hajj, an Imam alayhi salam, may Allah's choicest blessings be on this holy man, decides to leave Mecca without performing Hajj and head towards Karbala. One of the factors that influenced his decision to leave Mecca was the fact that during his stay of Sha'ban, Ramadan and Dhil Qa'd and that first week of Dhil Hajj during this period of three months and a week he began to receive mult a multitude of letters of invitation from the people of Kufa recall that the death of Muawiyah was public recall the demand for bay'ah was also public recall the presence of Imam Hussein and his publicity now 
to his cause in Mecca was also getting publicized. And therefore the people of Kufa came to know about it. And they wrote letters not in tens or hundreds, in thousands. The content of which was something like this. They're telling Imam, قَدْ أَيْنَعَتِ thimar the, the fruit is ripe. وَاخْضَرَّ janab The farm is green. وَطَمَّتِ الْجَمَاجِمْ The وَطَمَّتِ الْجِمَامْ The rivers are flowing. And the army is ready. Come over. We want to overthrow this corrupt regime and establish a regime of truth. We're ready to help you. Not ten people, not a hundred people, thousands of people expressing their willingness and readiness to stand up against injustice to establish justice. What should Imam do now? Five options. Number one, reject. Thanks very much for your letters, but I don't think so I'll be able to respond. Imam would never do that, because the moment a promise is made for support, and that support is reasonable, it is his duty to carry out that God-given task of establishing justice. A second option for the Imam is not to reject, but to say, well, to refuse to respond. But well, that would give the enemy the chance to then carry out their propaganda and their mission of spreading vice. A third option is not to reject the letters, not to refuse to respond, to respond, but to respond in a risky manner. Oh yes, I'm coming over. Let's begin our movement. Oh, you don't do that with the people of Kufa, the ones who betrayed the father and the brother. The fourth option. A response, but which is not risky, but which is risk-free. Oh yes, I'm ready to come, but not now. Uh, why don't you first galvanize and mobilize yourselves and get rid of that corrupt ruler, and then I'll come over. No ship can run without a captain. Imam wouldn't give that response. The fifth response which he gave to the invitation by the letters was a response of responsibility. Yes, your offer is rational, but there's a risk. In the past, you did betray my father and my brother. And therefore, I want to ascertain the truthfulness of your commitment and dedication. I'm sending my delegation. إِنِّي بَاعِثٌ إِلَيْكُمْ أَخِي وَابْنَ عَمِّي وَثِقَةِ مُسْلِمِ بْنَ عَقِيلٍ I'm sending my brother, my cousin, a person whom I have full and total reliance on. Muslim ibn Aqil was not an ordinary person. He had vast experience in the war, in the battlefield, in the time of the conquest that took place in the, in the Khilafat of Omar. He was given certain commanding positions in the Battle of Safin by his uncle Ali ibn Abi Talib. May Allah have peace on them all. He participated in the battlefield with Imam Hassan alayhi salam. Number four, his family, his children were present in Karbala. And number five, of course, this expression of full faith and reliance on him in this letter shows that this man was not ordinary. We all know the story of what happened. He came to Kufa and people expressed their support. And then when Yazid gets the information, his consultant, who was not a Muslim, that's one of the tragedies of the Muslim Ummah. We have consultants to our governors who do not have the interests of Islam in their heart. That consultant tells Yazid the only way to quash this rebellion under, which is building up under Muslims' leadership, is to send this ruthless, merciless, pitiless, cruel, brutal leader like Ubaidullah ibn Ziyad. <coughs> you all know what happened. He bought off some people. He intimidated and threatened some other people. He killed deliberately a few others to scare the rest. And all the supporters abandon Muslim Ibn Aqil. This double-facedness, this disloyalty, 
this treachery and betrayal of the people of Kufa was exactly the reason why Imam Hussein had sent Muslim Ibn Aqil. But the man was brave. The man had the full faith and the reliance of Imam Hussein, and he showed it on the battlefield. Muhammad Ibn Ash'ath was appointed by Ibn Ziyad to go and capture and to assassinate Muslim Ibn Aqil. At one point, Ibn Ash'ath, in the streets of Kufa, when the battle was taking place, Muslim is all alone now. His supporters have all fled. Yet, he valiantly and bravely defends himself. At one point, Ibn Ash'ath tells Ibn Ziyad, I want reinforcements. Ibn Ziyad says, there's one man, and you have all the, all the army with you. You cannot win over him. And you know what, is, what was the response of Ibn Ash'ath? Ibn Ash'ath says, you know, لَقَدْ بَعَثَّنِي إِلَىٰ أَسَدٍ ضَرْغَامٍ وَسَيْفٍ حُسَامٍ فِي كَفِّ بَطَلٍ humamin min ali khair al anam you know this man can strike ferociously like a lion the sword in his hand is sharp the man is from a particular pure strain and stock of a family that is brave he is a soldier who is invincible muslim ibn aqil yet finally he succumbs he's overwhelmed He's captured, he's brought to the, to the castle of Ibn Ziyad, but he never submits, he never even greets, he never even shows that respect to Ibn Ziyad. The loss that was suffered by Imam Hussein, by the death, can be gauged, the severity and the intensity of the grief can be gauged by the following conversation that took place. When Imam Hussein left, Mecca, on one of the stations known as Thalabiya, a traveler or a couple of travelers come to him. They say, we've got some news for you. We may disclose it in public if you so wish, but we prefer it to disclose to you in private. Imam Hussain alayhi salam looks around at his companions and he says, ma duna ha'ula min sir. I hide no secrets from these companions. Allahu Akbar. The Imam of the time, the Imam of that time had companions who were so close to him that they enjoyed the confidentiality to an extent that Imam kept no secrets from them. What is the news you've brought? The, be the last person who left Kufa informed us that Hani bin Urwa and Muslim ibn Aqil have been killed. And they've been dragged in the streets of Kufa. Imam expresses his grief by saying, Inna lillah wa inna ilayhi raji'un. Rahmatullah alayhima. We all are from God and we all will return back to Him. May Allah's special grace and love and mercy be on these two martyrs. He repeats this uh, se several times. Inna lillah wa inna ilayhi raji'un. Rahmatullah alayhima. These two travelers then advise, listen, Kufa is treacherous. It is going to betray you. Do not proceed. Remember the will that was made in Medina. Imam is clear about the goals of his movement. <coughs> he looks at the sons of Aqil. Muslim was a son of Aqil. He looks at the sons of Aqil. What do you advise? And they say, we vow to avenge the blood. Either we kill or we get killed. Of course, for the sake of truth, for the sake of Allah. Amazing determination. You know what Imam Hussain responds to that expression of dedication and determination to die in the call for the cause of truth? He says, لا خير في العيش بعد هؤلاء. I swear there is no pleasure in a life without the companionship of such companions who are ready to die for the sake of truth. Imam Hussein experienced a degree of grief and loss with the death of Muslim Ibn Aqil to an extent that even on the day of Ashura he remembered Muslim. 
in one of those sermons where he's addressing the people of Kufa, why do you want to kill me? You were the ones who invited me. You told me the fruits are ripe. You told me the rivers are flowing. You told me the garden is green. Everything is ready. Come over. The army is ready. And yet here you are. Against your promises, you want to kill me. The brother of the one who led the campaign against Muslim ibn Akhil, Muhammad ibn Ash'ath, his brother Qais ibn Ash'ath was there in Karbala. He tells Hussein, why don't you submit yourself to your cousins? Swear allegiance to them. All your problems will be solved. Imam replies to him, وَأَنْتَ أَخُوْ أَخِيك You are just like your brother. He promised immunity to Muslim ibn Aqil and then he betrayed him. أَتُرِيدُ أَنْ يَطْلُبَكَ بَنُوْ هَاشِمْ بِدَمٍ أَكْثَرَ مِنْ دَمِ Muslim ibn Aqil do you wish that Bani Hashim should want to avenge blood from you more than the blood of Muslim ibn Aqil? Amazing experience of loss that Imam Hussein underwent with the loss of Muslim ibn Aqil to an extent that on the day of Ashura, he still expressed it, he still felt it, he still displayed it. And that is why, in conclusion, I wish to remind ourselves of these wonderful words that we are taught to recite in ziyarah in respect for this great man Muslim ibn Aqil Assalamu alayka ayyuhal abdus salih our respect, our greetings, our salutations O oh, the servant of God al muti'u lillahi wa li rasulihi wa li amir al mu'mineen wal hasani wal hussein who was total in his loyalty and obedience to God and to the Prophet and to Imam Ali and Imam Hassan and Imam Hussein alayhi salam. Ashhadu annaka qad madayta bima madha bihi al-badriyun. I swear that you lived the same values like the people of Badr. Wal mujahideen fi sabilillah. Wal mubaligheen fi al-jihad. And those who struggled and who strived and who sacrificed whatever they had against the enemies of God in the help and the, and the support of the servants of God. Assalamu alaik, ya Aba Abdullah, wa ala al arwah alati hallat bi finaik, wa anakhat bi rahlik, alaikum minna jami'an salamullah abadan ma baqina wa baqiya al-layl wa al-nahar wassalamu alaykum wa rahmatullah A'udhu Billahi Minash Shaitan Rajim. Before we start this short discussion, because we hope to remind ourselves of certain realities that would bring about a certain change and transformation in our lives for improvement, for development, for perfection. Definitely shaitan is going to try to obstruct this process. And therefore, we need to seek the protection of Allah from the potential deviation that shaitan may try to create in us. We have to be aware that he has been expelled from God's kingdom of his special mercy because of his rebellion and because of his 
arrogance. <clears throat> Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Having dealt with the potential obstruction that we may face, we then ask for God's help for three reasons. Because He is Allah, is the absolute perfect being, and therefore any perfection, any goodness, any guidance that we hope to achieve necessarily has to originate from Him and Him alone. Of course, by the time it reaches us, it can pass through a variety of media. And secondly, we ask for His help in achieving any goodness and any guidance because He is Rahman, His Rahma, His love, His mercy, His care, His attention spreads out to reach each and every entity in the universe, brings it into existence, maintains it, sustains it, provides it with all that is necessary for its existence and development. And thirdly, we seek His help and guidance because He is Rahim. Abundant mercy, tremendous grace, continuous love is available to those amongst us who believe in Him, who admit to His existence, and then who submit themselves to His will. وَالصَّلَاةُ وَالسَّلَامُ عَلَىٰ سَيِّدِنَا وَنَبِيِّنَا مُحَمَّدُ وَآلِهِ الطَّاهِرِينَ And we send our deep sense of respect, salutations, greetings, our expression of love and loyalty to the Holy Prophet and to his progeny because of two reasons. Number one, the Holy Prophet was the most perfect man and he achieved this perfection because his understanding and his comprehension of who God is, of what God's attributes are, and of how God is running the universe, his understanding was the maximum possible for any human being. And secondly, he is the most perfect human being because that understanding then translates itself in his life, in that in all aspects of his life, be it private or public, be it his physical dimension of existence or emotional or even the cognitive element, in all phases of existence, he was the most submissive to the will of God and likewise his progeny and especially so the third holy Imam whom we have gathered to commemorate we pay our deepest respects we express our love and our loyalty he was afforded that unique opportunity to sacrifice all that he had for the sake of Allah in order to establish godly values on the earth, thereby making his movement, uprising, sacrifice, a supreme role model, a unique historical event which then becomes the source of inspiration for all movements into the future, up until the final establishment of global justice and divine values throughout the earth. Elders in Islam and brethren in Islam, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. We said last night that the Imams and the leaders of the Ahlul Bayt have instructed us to assemble, to gather, to commemorate, to remember the tragedy of Karbala in order to enable us to then empathize in order to enable us to understand those godly values, to appreciate them, to imbibe them, to integrate them in our lives and therefore bring about a change toward perfection. And therefore, we need to 
emphasize and focus on this particular attitude and perspective and that is we should not only listen to the tragedy and cry oh this was tremendous suffering and any human being who undergoes such a tremendous amount of suffering is worthy of sympathy but that would be for any other human being the important thing the Ahlul Bayt wanted us to achieve in this process was to be able to identify and to imbibe and to integrate those godly values which manifested itself in the tragedy of Karbala. Allow me therefore to focus on one of those supreme virtues which manifested itself. Traditionally on such a night we tend to remember the sacrifice made by one of the companions who was the first companion who gave up his life for Imam Hussein on the day of Ashura and that was Hur, son of Yazid for the family and the tribe of Riyahi Tamimi. One of the supreme virtues in the life of Hur is that of Tawbah, is that of repentance, of penitence, of conversion, of transformation from a life of disobedience to a life of obedience. But allow me to put things into perspective in relation to our times before I dwell into the concept of Tawbah in theory and then in practice in the case of Hur. There was an interesting uh, study conducted by the researchers at the Roper Starch Worldwide. They surveyed about 35,000 uh, consumers in 35 different countries. And they asked them about the importance of different values in their life. You see, the assumption is with the process of globalization, it's not only merchandise which is spreading all over, it's not only that now increasingly more and more people are beginning, for example, to watch the same movies and to listen to the same music and to begin to purchase and enjoy the same merchandise. It's not only movies and music and merchandise, more important, it's a globally shared morality. Values increasingly are becoming the same in the population throughout the world. This study on consumers just gives us an idea. The report, res researchers then reported that from the responses they could categorize six different attitudes, six different lifestyles, six different mindsets. So they say it doesn't matter, you, uh, you meet a Henry or a Mary or you meet Henrik uh, or Maria, or I would say you meet a Harun or you meet a Maryam, right now these mindsets are globally shared. Number one, they suggest there's a mindset known uh, as the creatives. They say these are the Renaissance people. They're the ones who are deeply committed to learning, to technology. If you were to summarize the motto of their life they say challenge my mind the creatives broaden my horizon the creatives that's one mindset a second mindset that they report are the fun seekers they are the people who want to enjoy life they focus on excitement on recreation on relaxation. If you were to summarize the motto of their life, they say, entertain me with fun, with friends, with fantasy, the fun seekers. A third mindset which is becoming global, they suggest, are the intimates. They value personal relationship, family, friends. If you were to summarize the motto of the intimates, motto of life, they would say, help me relax and enjoy in the company of my close ones, family or friends. 
A fourth mindset that they identify are the strivers, the workaholics, the ambitious, the one who are driven by the desire to attain power and prestige. The motto of their life is, don't waste my time. <coughs> What's in it for me? A fifth mindset that they identified from these 35,000 consumers that they surveyed are the altruists, the ones who wor work for humanitarian causes, environment, anti-war, peace. The motto in their life is, help me to contribute to the world. And finally, a sixth mindset that they identified are the devout, the traditionalists who value the religious traditions that they have received. They're committed to duty, to respect, to authority. The motto in their life, the motto in their life can be summarized as respect me and those of my faith. If it's true that these mindsets are becoming global, whether we like it or not, depending on our exposure and depending on the degree to which we are influenced by the environment, definitely these mindsets are there amongst us also. Question. From the Islamic perspective, what is the lifestyle? What is the motto? What is the mindset? What is the morality that I'm supposed to adopt? Answer. If one major characteristic of the Islamic mindset could be presented is the word Tawbah. Observe. The Quran emphasizes on certain realities about human existence. Number one, the fact that every human being, whether he likes it or not, whether he knows it or not, is on a journey. In his life, he's on a movement. He is moving gradually towards a particular destination. Whether he likes it or not, he <coughs> will reach that destination. Surah in Shiqaq, chapter 84. Allah says, Ya ayyuhal insan, O man, not believers, not people of the book, all mankind, all of you, innaka kadihun ila rabbika kadhan famulaqih. All of you, without exception, are on the move. You are progressing. You are proceeding toward your Lord, whether you like it or not, whether you accept him or reject him, you shall meet him. Then there are two categories once they meet their Lord. فَأَمَّا مَنْ أُوْتِيَ كِتَابَهُ بِيَمِينِهِ فَسَوْفَ يَنْقَلِبُ إِلَىٰ أَهْلِهِ مَسْرُورًا There is that group that after meeting their Lord, they will meet a Lord of mercy, of compassion, of grace, of love, of reward. And there's another category, فَأَمَّا مَنْ أُوْتِيَ كِتَابَهُ وَرَاءَ الظَّهْرِهِ فَسَوْفَ يَدْعُ ثُبُورًا وَيَصْلَ سَعِيرًا There's a second category, who shall meet a Lord of wrath, of chastisement, of punishment, of fury, of displeasure, of distancing, of rejection. What decides the manner in which we will meet our Lord, and every human being will meet his Lord, the deciding factor is the lifestyle. Many will be those who will regret at that time why did they not use the opportunity to prepare for this meeting, which is going to happen nevertheless. 
There are numerous verses in the Quran which keep on reminding us about this. Ala ilallahi tarji'u al-umur, ala ilallahi tasiru al-umur, wa anna ila rabbika ruj'a, wa anna ila rabbika al-muntaha. And perhaps one of the most famous verses that epitomizes this gradual, continuous, progressive movement toward the Lord is Surah Baqarah, chapter 2, ayah number 155, which says, Inna lillah. We're all from him. We never came here by our choice. It was his love. It was his mercy. It was his will. It was his wisdom that decided to bring us in this place at this time. وَإِنَّا إِلَيْهِ رَاجِعُونَ We came without our will. But our return back to him will be determined by our choice, by our volition, by our decision. So, reality number one, all of us are on the move. Reality number two, we shall meet our Lord. Number three, we can either meet a Lord of mercy or of punishment. Number four, what decides whether we will meet love or displeasure is our lifestyle. Question. Has my Lord guided me to help me choose a particular mindset, an attitude, a lifestyle, a moral value system, which will enable me then to meet him <coughs> and receive his grace and mercy? Answer. Which talk about tawbah. For example, Surah Tahrim, chapter 66, ayah number 8. Allah says, Ya ayyuhal ladheena amanu, tubu ila Allahi tawbatan nasuha. All those who believe, come back, return. Come back to your Lord in a process of returning, which is sincere, which is earnest, which is, which is with the totality of your being. Come back to your Lord. If you do so, you asa rabbukum an yukaffir ankum sayyatikum. Whatever evil, whatever mistakes, whatever damage, whatever danger, whatever harm that you have done to yourself or to others, Allah will accept that, will forgive that, will eliminate that from your lives. Not only that, after having cleansed and purified you, وَيُدْخِلْكُمْ وَيُدْخِلُكُمْ فِي جَنَّاتٍ تَجْرِ مِنْ تَحْتِهَا الْأَنْهَارِ And He shall then enable you to enter paradise. Notice, Tawbah alone is being introduced as a particular attitude, a characteristic lifestyle that would then deserve that would then qualify us to deserve entry into paradise. Remember, one of the purposes of lamentation, of weeping, of mourning, is to be able to identify those virtues and values that will then pull us towards Jannah, and one of them is Tawbah. The basic question that we should now answer is, why is Tawbah so important? <coughs> it's interesting, there's one surah in the Qur'an where the crucial importance of Tawbah throughout history is highlighted. For example, several past prophetic communities have been mentioned. Surah Hud, chapter 11. It's a surah which is revealed in Mecca, toward the end of the period of the Prophet's stay in Mecca. A period where the persecution now builds up. Towards the end, the Prophet then loses the major support that he enjoyed of his wife Khadija and of Abu Talib. You can imagine the mental state of the Prophet and the believers at that time. And therefore, the purpose which Surah Hud serves, which is that of reminding the Prophet, your case is not unique. The past Prophets also brought message, messages from God. People did not accept them. They persecuted the prophets. 
they responded negatively and the prophets persevered and finally Allah expressed his will of damnation when Allah discusses these various communities there are some common themes that appear for almost all prophets one of them is Tawbah interesting observe chapter 11 Surah Hud beginning with ayah number 2 ayah number 1 says Allah has sent down this book ayah number 2 so that you may worship none other than him so that you may direct to all your God given energies toward his praise toward his gratitude toward his obedience ibadah ayah number 3 and you should ask for forgiveness from your Lord. And then you should repent and return back unto him. That's the case of the Holy Prophet. The next 20 verses then discuss about the various problems that the people in Mecca at that time were creating for the Prophet. Ayah number 25 turns his attention towards Prophet Nuh. Allah says, وَلَقَدْ أَرْسَلْنَا نُوحًا إِلَىٰ قَوْمِهِ إِنِّي لَكُمْ نَذِيرٌ مُّبِينٌ The ayah here does not talk about istighfar. Surah Nuh itself, chapter 70, talks about istighfar. Nuh said, I preach day and night. One of my main messages to the people was, come back to your Lord. Istighfiru. Rabbakum. Yursilis Sama'a Alaykum Midrara. That's Prophet Nuh. There's a lengthy discussion about Prophet Nuh, beginning from ayah number 25, ending at ayah number 50. The third Prophet then mentioned in Surah Hud. Wa ila Adin Akhahum Huda. And remember the community of Ad, we sent their own brother, their own member, Hud. You know what Hud preached? Same message, worship your Lord, focus your energy toward Him. Ya qawmi istaghfiru rabbakum thumma tubu ilayh tawbah. Ayah number 60, the focus then shifts to Thamud. Wa ila Thamud akhahum saliha. Recall the, the message sent by Salih to his brethren, worship your Lord. Huwa an sha'akum min al ard. You have been created from the earth by your Lord. Thumma wasta'amarakum fiha. He enabled you. He empowered you. Your Lord gave you the power and facilitated and capacitated you then to build this wonderful technology whereby you can now colonize the earth. But the mindset, the attitude that you need to develop, Salih tells his people, Tawbah. Istighfar. That's the third prophet. The fourth prophet, the focus then shifts in ayah number 90. Allah talks about Prophet Shu'ayb. Ayah number 90 says, وَاسْتَغْفِرُوا رَبَّكُمْ ثُمَّ تُوبُوا إِلَيْهِ Shu'ayb also emphasized the same message. Amazing. Almost all the prophets talked about Tawbah as a lifestyle, as a mindset. No. The first prophet who was created, the first man who set foot on the earth, if there was one characteristic that guaranteed his progress and success on the earth, it was Tawbah. When Adam was expelled from Jannah after he was deceived and duped by the devil, and then when he realized his mistake, which was not a sin, it was a test, he is reinstated back into that state of awareness and presence and the love and the constant attention toward Allah through the process of Tawbah. فَتَلَقَّى آدَمُ مِن رَبِّهِ كَلِمَاتٍ ثُمَّ تَابَ عَلَيْهِ إِنَّهُ هُوَ التَّوَّابُ الرَّحِيمُ Chapter 2, Ayah number 37. Conclusion. According to the Qur'an, one way to ensure 
that this process of return that is happening all the time, whether we like it or not, whether we know it or not, it's happening. One way to ensure that the conscious decision in this process of return and movement to the Lord becomes a positive one is to develop the attitude of Tawbah. The next question then is, how do I then practice Tawbah in such a way in order to ensure that it does transform my life? The Quran mentions several examples. I will just quote one. Surah Tawbah, chapter 9 itself. It was revealed towards the Prophet's last years in Medina. The Prophet had established authority in Medina. Now there were potential threats on the borders towards the north. The Prophet mobilized an army to go there. There were some who participated, others gave excuses. Oh, it's very hot. Um, you know, in the northern border, there are these uh, fair-skinned women with blue eyes. Um, we're afraid we'll get, we'll get deviated. Allow us not to come. There is fitna out there. Several excuses. One particular case merits attention. Chapter 9, Surah Tawbah, ayah number 111. O oh, Prophet, sorry, 118. O oh, Prophet, remember the case of Tawbah that happened in the example of those three individuals. They decided not to come with you. And then in order to punish them, you boycotted them. They were excommunicated for willfully, deliberately not participating in the war effort. The Islamic State needs protection. The head of the state himself needs protection. You decided that your own desires, your own comfort was more important than the welfare of the community. You disobeyed the command of God. Therefore, you will be excommunicated. They underwent a process of grief, a process of remorse, a process whereby they felt very uneasy. They said, this is a terrible mistake we've made in our lives. But what can we do? Look at the description the Quran gives of the mental state of these individuals. How the process of Tawbah develops. The whole earth which is so spacious and wide suddenly became narrow for them. They just couldn't go anywhere. Family rejects them. Friends reject them. Where do they go? The pressure kept on building up within themselves also. They felt remorse. They felt pain. They felt uneasy. They felt terrible about themselves. Two, three. مَلْجَأَ مِنَ اللَّهِ إِلَّا إِلَيْهِ At the time when external pressure built up, at a time when the internal pressure built up, they then reached a point of realization that, Oh, our Lord, we have earned your displeasure and therefore we are disconnected. And now we are dumped. We are dumped away. We have no mercy and no grace from you. But where do I go? There is no place where I can go to solve my problem except back to you. That was the time when the heart was ready to receive the special grace from Allah. Allah then turned toward them. Those who had been dumped, He turned toward them with His special grace, with His extra love, with that, with that favor. He lifted them up. And they asked for forgiveness and Allah forgave them. Why? In Allah huwa tawwabur rahim. Surely God alone is the oft forgiving and the oft merciful. Let me stop here for the moment. In summary, what I have tried to remind ourselves is all of us, whether we like it or not, are on a journey. 
the journey has an end. The manner in which we will meet our end will be decided by our mindset, our attitude, and our lifestyle. One of the deciding factors that will enable us to meet a Lord of mercy, not a Lord of chastisement, is the state of Tawbah. And this state of Tawbah is beautifully illustrated in the case of Hur. <coughs> Allow me to explain the case of Hur in order to enable us then to derive some lessons which we, we can then try to imbibe and integrate in our lives. Notice after Imam Hussein received the news on his journey between Mecca toward Kufa that Muslim Ibn Aqil has already been assassinated. <coughs> Imam was proceeding, they reached a point known as Sharaf. At that point, he asked for extra water to be collected. The youths in the camp, in the caravan, filled up all the water bottles that they had. As they moved ahead the next day, around noon time, one of the people in the caravan says, Allahu Akbar! I said, what's happening? He says, oh, I noticed uh, a date palm, palm spring coming uh, up ahead. And the other said, hey, we know this route. There is no date palm trees around this area. What you're actually seeing are the heads of the horses and the tips of the spears. Imam's immediate reaction was, we need to take defense. Look for a place whereby we can take protection from the back so that we meet the enemy only from one side. When the enemy arrives, they're exhausted. They're tired. Imam offers them water to all the members, including the animals. Having relieved them of their thirst, Imam then addresses them. Identify yourselves. And they say, we are the companions of Ubaidullah bin Ziyad. Who is your leader? Hur ibn Yazid al-Riyahi. O oh, son of Yazid. Hur's father was Yazid. Yazid al-Riyahi, Tamim. Are you our friend or are you our foe? Aba Abdullah. I've come against you. I've come with an order and instruction that I'm supposed to deflect you and direct you back toward Kufa and deliver you to the hands of Ubaidullah ibn Ziyad. Imam says that will never happen. Interestingly, it's the time for prayers. Imam says, we are praying and why don't you proceed for your prayers? Look at the positive attitude Hur had. He says, no, you establish prayers, nusalli bi salatik. We shall pray with you. Unlike in Karbala, there was prayer in Hussein's camp and there was prayer in Omar Saad's camp, but two different prayers. Hur came to pray behind Imam and the effect of praying behind an Imam, whereby he becomes your medium between you and your Lord. That effect gradually manifests itself on the day of Ashura. <coughs> Imam takes the opportunity of now having a thousand people before him and he addresses them. I have to explain to you what is happening. It seems most of you sent me letters of invitation. Come over. We don't have a leader. Perhaps we will achieve progress and will achieve prosperity with your leadership. I have come in response to your invitation. You have two options. Either you select and accept my leadership, or you reject me. In case you have changed your mind and you no longer want to support me, then let me go back. But don't intercept. Don't intervene. Hor says, I know of no letters that were written to you. Imam orders one of his companions, bring out the letters. Thousands of letters were shown. Oh, but we never wrote these letters. Well, Imam says, if you did not write these letters, then what are you going to decide to do? He says, well, I'm under instruction. I have to take you back to, to Ubaidullah ibn Ziyad. Imam smiles. He says, we're going to face death before that. I'm never ever going to submit myself to Ibn Ziyad. Amazing, Imam Hussein uses this opportunity for a few days that he is with Hur to declare his mission all over again. Allah 
في لقاء الحق Don't you see you are living in circumstances when truth is being rejected, when falsehood is being practiced? Don't you see in such circumstances it is the duty of a believer to go arise and meet his Lord, but not to accept this life of humiliation and of disgrace? Mission statement. It's amazing. Three, four different lectures and speeches are made by the Imam. But one supreme final effect that comes out is on the day of Ashura. At one point, Hur says, I have no choice but to intercept. When Imam gives the instruction to the caravan, get the ladies ready, get the camp ready, we are going to make a move, we are moving. Hur came and intercepted. Imam said, Thakalatka ummuk, ماذا تريد أن تصنع? May your mother weep over you. What is the matter with you? What do you want from us? Hor says, I swear if there was any Arab man who spoke to me the way you did, I would have replied to him. But look at the reverence, the respect, the admiration this man had for the holy lady Fatima. He says, but what do I do? Your mother is a holy lady. I shall not say anything about her, but respectfully. Notice the various factors that are working, that are preparing the ground for the final conversion that will play, take place on the day of Ashura. They proceed, they move towards various stations. The message comes from Ibn Ziyad, Ja'jah bil Hussein, you must intercept now. Stop him wherever he is. Stop him at a point where there is no water. Stop him at a point where they have no access to any trees or any farms. The policy now is becoming starve him and let him die of thirst. Imam Hussein decides not to stop at one or two or three other places which are suggested to him till finally they reach a point where he asks, it was incidentally on a Thursday, what is the name of this place? And he's told that it's got various names, one of which is Karbala. And Imam then makes a dua saying, Allahumma inni a'udhu bika min al-karbi wal-bala. O oh Allah, I seek protection from karb, from afflictions. O oh Allah, I seek protection from suffering. Ha huna mahattu rikabina. Ha huna mahallu quburina. Ha huna mahallu safki dimaina. Companions, this is the end of the journey. We are now going to rest and stop here. This is the place, Karbala, where our blood will be shed. This is the place where we will finally be laid to rest. <coughs> Imam Hussein arrives in Karbala. I want to quickly shift our attention to Ashura and the state of mind that Hur was undergoing. On the morning of Ashura, he tells Omar al-Sa'ad, are you going to fight with this man till death? Omar al-Sa'ad says, of course, e wallah, nuqatilu qitalan shadidan aysarahu an tuqta'a al-ru'us wa tuti'ha al-aydi. The minimum is heads will be chopped off. The minimum is hands will be wrestled away. This is going to be a bloody, violent, brutal battle to the death. Hur is amazed. But this is the son of the daughter of the Prophet. Well, don't, don't you have options to stop the battle? Well, he's made some, some suggestions. He wants, he wants immunity. Why don't you allow him to go somewhere else? You don't have to forcefully deliver him to Ibn Ziyad. Omar Asad says, I have no choice. You know the commander has instructed us. I have to deliver him. Hur realized at this point that his beginning understanding was faulty. Praying behind the Imam, listening to the speeches which clarified his mission, accompanying him and finally reaching a point whereby he then sees that Omar Asad and the other companions seem to be blind to the truth and he, any attempts to guide them fail. He then finds himself at a crucial point, at a crossroad. Other members of his tribe say, we tried, 
we saw him on that day that he started moving away from the camp toward the camp of Imam Hussein. And we said, Hur, what is the problem with, with you? Are you trying to launch an attack on the camp of Imam Hussein? And Hur, this narrator says, I saw Hur tremble. And I, and I said, Inna amraka la murib. You seem, you, you, your, your affairs are turning into a very strange behavior. If I were ever to be asked, who is the most bravest man in Kufa, I would not hesitate to mention your name. And yet I see you tremble. At this moment, Hur gives a statement which tells us the inner mental turmoil that titanic clash that was taking place in his life. The crucial crossroad at which he had to make a decision. He says, Wallahi, ukhayyiru nafsi bayn al-jannati wal-nar. I swear by God, I find myself between the choice for Jannah, Tawbah, and the fire of hell. I've tried my best to convince, but they are not ready to see the truth. Wallahi, I swear by God, la akhtaru illa al jannah. I have made my decision. There is no way I will prefer a life of humiliation and disgrace and an authority of the devils over the choice of following Imam Hussein. Even, even if my body is going to be dismembered, even if I am going to be burnt, my decision is made. Amazing. The conversion took place. Hur then transports himself to the camp of Imam Hussein. He comes with his shield turned inside out as an indication that I have come to surrender. He apologizes <coughs> for forcing Imam Hussein to come there. Imam says, you're welcome. Hur says, no, I don't want to disembark. We don't know why, but perhaps maybe he did not want to <coughs> feel the embarrassment of facing the other members of the camp for the potential mistake that he did. He offers then to go to the battlefield. He comes to the battlefield and speaks to the people of Kufa. I never knew anything about the letters. You are the one who wrote the letters inviting him. When he did come, what do you do? You surround him. And you want to surrender him. No, now you want to starve him. He, well, here's the river. The pigs and the dogs can use water from here. The non-Muslims, the Jews, the Christians, the Magians, all of them can partake of this water. But you're denying this man. I swear by God, I swear by God, you have failed in your duty against the Prophet. La The day when everyone is going to rise up in thirst, may Allah not quench your thirst. However, the speech had no effect, unfortunately. Hur then launches his attack in defense. Inni an al hur. Ma'wadhaif. He gives us a battle cry. If you don't know me, I am Hur. I'm a host to this holy man, unlike you were with disloyal, treacherous betrayers. Inni an al-hur ma'wadhaif adhribuku adhribu fi a'naqikum bis-sayf and I will strike and strike forcefully with a sword. And you know why? Because I'm in defense an afdali man halla bi ard al-khayf because he's the son of the best man who lived in Mecca and Medina. And I fear not death. Amazing transformation in this man, whereby he is then ready to launch himself into death for the sake of defense of the truth. Finally, when he is killed and injured severely, the companions bring his body back to the camp. Imam Hussein then comes to his body, cleans the dust from his face, and makes one statement of approval and satisfaction with the whole life of Hur. He says, Anta Hurrun, you truly are liberated from the slavery of the past sins. Anta kama sammatka ummuka, Hurrun, fit 
dunya wa hurrun fil akhirah truly your mother was right when she named you as hur a liberated person from the slavery of sins and that is the essence of tawba let's pray to allah to give us tawfiq to be able to understand the significance of tawba and to integrate and to imbibe it in our lives to enable us undertake this journey back to Allah. <coughs> Assalamu alaik ya Aba Abdullah wa ala al arwah alati hallat bi finaik wa anakhat bi rahlik. Alaikum minna jami'an salamullah abadan ma baqina wa baqiya al laylu wa nahar. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم. Before we start our discussion, wherein we hope to remind ourselves of certain realities and hope to bring about some change in our lives, some goodness, some guidance, we need to be aware that any process of seeking perfection will necessarily come across hurdles and obstruction from the devil and therefore we begin with the prayer of seeking protection of Allah who out of his love and out of his infinite power can enable us to guard ourselves from the insinuations and the whisperings of deviation of shaitan <coughs> The shaitan who has been expelled from the kingdom of God's special mercy because of his arrogance and because of his defiance and disobedience. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. And as we aspire to achieve perfection, we need to ask the help and the guidance of God because of three reasons. Number one, He is Allah, the absolute perfect being, and therefore any perfection, any goodness, any guidance that we hope to achieve necessarily has to originate from Him and Him alone. Though it may reach us finally after passing through a variety of mediums. And secondly, we seek His help for achieving any goodness and any guidance because he's Rahman, <coughs> his Rahmah, his love, his care, his attention toward us. It's universal, it's all pervasive, it spreads out to reach each and every entity in existence, causes it to come into existence, provides it with all that's necessary for its existence, sustains it, nourishes it, maintains it, and develops it, and provides for all that is necessary for its perfection. And thirdly, we seek his help and his guidance because he is Rahim. He promises abundant love, extra mercy, continuous grace to anyone who responds to him 
who admits to his existence, who submits to his will. Wassalatu wassalamu ala Sayyidina wa Nabiyyina Muhammad wa alihi al-Tahirin. And we send our salutations and our greetings and our expression of love and loyalty to the Holy Prophet of Islam. That most perfect man who achieved the highest perfection possible for any human being because of two reasons. Number one, his understanding and his comprehension of who God is, of what God's beautiful attributes are, his perfect love, his infinite wisdom, his unlimited knowledge, his absolute power, his continuous grace, his myriad manifestations of perfection, his understanding of who God is and of what his attributes are and of how moment by moment by wisdom and by power and by majesty is governing the universe. And secondly, this comprehension translated in his life such that in all aspects, in all dimensions of his life, private or public, mental or emotional or physical, he was the most submissive and humble before God. And we send our salutations and greetings on his holy progeny who are almost his equivalents, but necessarily secondary to him in perfection. And especially so on the third holy Imam, whose tragedy we have gathered to commemorate, whose sacrifice was so supreme that it then became the role model and a source of inspiration for all future movements to establish justice. In fact, continuously up until the last final global movement to establish godly values throughout the earth. Elders in Islam, brethren in Islam, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Having reminded ourselves about the significance and the importance and the tremendous reward that is promised for assemblies like this, for gatherings, for commemoration. And secondly, having understood that the possible justification for these tremendous rewards is that during the process of participation, we try to identify those supreme godly virtues and values and then we try to imbibe them and integrate them in our lives and thereby preparing the ground to qualify us then to receive God's special grace and God's continuous reward in fact to a limit where there is no possibility to comprehend the enormity and the profundity of the reward. We suggested that one of those virtues that manifests itself, that displays itself, was the virtue of Tawbah. I would like to expand on that same virtue further tonight. There's an interesting historical fact mentioned in uh, about Imam's biography, and that is that he performed Hajj multiple times. In fact, some traditions say he performed it 25 times in Al Hussein ibn Ali, Hajj, Khamsan, wa Ishreena Marratan Mashiyan. He performed Hajj on foot 25 times. Allow me to expand on this process of Hajj and the effect that it can potentially have with its full results manifesting itself in Karbala. And then I would quote a specific example 
One of the heroes in Karbala is Zuhair bin Qayn, about whom we wish to discuss a little more in detail later on. Zuhair also came back from Hajj. He was originally from Kufa, and he was traveling almost parallel with the caravan of Imam Hussein, and later on joins him. But before I expand on the concept of Hajj and its relationship to the event of Karbala, allow me to remind ourselves of the connection that's mentioned in the Quran. The concept of Hajj is discussed in the Quran in various surahs. In Surah Baqarah chapter 2, in Surah Ali Imran chapter 3, in Surah Ma'idah chapter 5, and in Surah Al-Hajj, of course, chapter 22. The most extensive discussion, of course, is in Surah Baqarah and in Surah Al-Hajj. The interesting fact is, right connected to the concept of Hajj is the discussion on Jihad. In Surah Baqarah, around ayah number 190-something is the discussion on Jihad. And then toward the end of that discussion, the discussion of Hajj begins. In Surah Hajj, beginning from ayah number 25 onwards till ayah number 37, the discussion is about Hajj. Ayah number 38 onwards is the discussion on Jihad. Interesting. We need to, we need to explore the role Hajj can play in enabling the pilgrim at the end of the whole process of Hajj to become so dedicated and devoted to God that then he is ready and willing to sacrifice. Observe. The, the process of Hajj begins with entering into the state of Ihram. Just like Salah has a takbir which then makes certain things which were otherwise halal, haram for us, to speak to other human beings is halal, but in salah it becomes haram. To look to the right and left away from qibla is halal, but in the process of salah it becomes haram. The takbir is that entry point where these items temporarily become haram, so the takbir is a haram. Likewise, the hajj has got an entry point which is known as ihram. The ihram is essentially a decision in the mind that for the sake of God, I am now going to restrict on myself certain activities. A, pertaining to my sexual faculty, for example. I will not look or touch or kiss or engage in the full sexual contact for or masturbate five no even solemnize the contract of marriage that's one group of items that we make haram on ourselves a second group of items no self beautification no use of beautification on the on the eyes no looking into the mirror no use of perfume, no use of oil. Second category. A third category I make haram on myself after ihram. Clothing, simplicity in clothing. No shade, no head cover, women have no face cover, clothes are simple, no shoes, no socks. Yet a fourth category. Defensive items, I will not hunt, I will not carry arms, I will not cause bleeding, I will not cut my nails, I will not remove hair, I won't harm an insect. And finally, of course, no quarreling and no lying. If we can recategorize these 25 items, all those activities which provoke my passion, no. All those activities which stimulate my power and aggression, no. All those activities which induce my pride and egotism, no. 
the root causes of the majority of the evil in human behavior all brought under control for the sake of God and God alone. That's a haram. Hajj being a deliberate spiritual journey whereby I've made a decision that I want to get closer to God. God the all perfect all infinite, majestic, loving, kind Lord. He's so close to me. He's as close as close can be. He's close to me as close can be in power. Oh, he has more power over me than I have over myself. He's so close to me as close can be in knowledge. Oh, he knows me more than I know myself. He's close to me as close can be in as far as love and care and concern is concerned. He loves me more than I can ever even love myself. But I got a problem. The reverse doesn't apply. I don't feel that degree of proximity and nearness to him. Problem? Because I've got so many other factors of otherness in my life. I need to remove... I need to distance, I need to disconnect, I need to detach before I can attach. I need to distract myself before I can attract myself to Him. And one of the best ways, Ihram. And then God of, out of His mercy challenges us. Interesting, Surah Ma'idah, chapter 5, ayah number 92, Allah says, in the state of Ihram, you're not allowed to hunt for a prey. And yet the preceding verse says, Ya ayyuhal ladheena amanu, la taqtulu sayda wa antum hurum. Don't hunt animals of prey. Yet the preceding verse, chapter 5, ayah number 94, Ya ayyuhal ladheena amanu, لَيَبْلُوَنَّكُمُ اللَّهُ بِشَيْءٍ مِّنَ الصَّيْدِ تَنَالُهُ أَيْدِيكُمْ وَرِمَاحُكُمْ O believer, in the state of Ihram, I want to train you and discipline you to make you pure. I warn you not to seek certain items. For example, one of the 25 items, don't hunt. You know what? I'm going to send an animal of prey near you. And that animal of prey is going to come so close to you that if you just pick up the spear and throw, you get him. No! I am going to send a prey of animal who's going to be so near to you. Forget your spear. Just stretch your hand out. And there it is. But beware. Beware, I've warned you. You're in the state of ihram. You're in the process of self-discipline. Ihram as a process of heightened alertness, heightened awareness, increased attention of being in the presence of God. So that I may test you. I may evaluate you. I want to challenge you. How true are you? in your desire to seek closeness and proximity to me. Ihram. Notice the self-disciplining that God wants us to achieve. One, two. You enter into the state of Ihram by declaring something. Labbaik Allahumma labbaik. O Lord, I have recognized who you are. And I, I admit that there is no power in the entire universe who deserves to be believed in, to be adored, to be thanked, to be loved, to be praised, to be obeyed, other than you. Labbaik, Allahumma labbaik. The interesting thing about labbaik that the Hajj should train us is that it's not a one once statement made, no. It is mustahab to repeat the labbaik from the beginning of Miqat throughout that journey from Medina all the way to Mecca. In the time of the Prophet, it took almost about eight days.
maybe it takes about eight hours right now nevertheless the point is repetition the point is consolidation of that frame of mind labbaik allahumma labbaik the hadith says that ma min muhillin yuhillu bit talbiyati illa ahalla man ala yaminihi ila maqta'i turab wa man ala yasarihi ila maqta'i turab there is no person who recites talbiyah in the true sense O oh Lord, here I am in full response to your call, to your invitation. I'm here in obedience, but that whatever is there on the right up until the eye can see and whatever is there on the left up until what the eye can see are all in unison reciting Talbiyah. The pilgrim is supposed to experience the harmony and the unity and the oneness with the entirety, with the totality of the universe, whereby every particle is true identity and reality is, yes, my Lord, I'm in total obedience to you. Amazing. Look at the training which will manifest itself in Karbala, moment by moment. In fact, it's mustahab to repeat the state of mind again and again as you embark on your mount as you disembark whether you are in private or you are in public whether you are awake whether you go to sleep the first the last item you should speak before you go to sleep in the state of ihram the first item you should pronounce before you wake up labbaik allahumma labbaik it becomes so firmly consolidated in the mind and the heart to an extent that the hadith says, Man mata muhriman, hushira mulabbiya. Whosoever dies in the state of ihram shall be resurrected back to life in the day of judgment. And the first thing he speaks out is, Labbaik, Allahumma labbaik. Once the pilgrim arrives at the holy house, it's recommended that you enter the Masjid al-Haram from a particular entry point known as Babu Salam. Three reasons have been mentioned for that. The idols which were used for worship by the idolaters before the Prophet of Islam, those idols were built from the ground of Babu Salam. The idols after they were removed by the Prophet they were buried at that spot in fact that was a spot where idol worshiping took place symbolically when you enter that point you are smashing oh Lord if I were to be there with the Prophet this would have been my behavior iconoclastic I would smash idols in my life any power that projects itself in my life and requests for my influence and my obedience. If it's not a power validated by God, it's an idol for me. And I've expressed my resistance, my rejection against it. Two, three. When we reach the Kaaba and the pilgrim is supposed to make that tawaf, the center which represents the house of God. O oh Lord, step by step, I'm moving toward you and I'm moving away from anything that's other than you. O oh Lord, at every step in my life, at every, in every act, in every feeling, in every thought, I want to get closer to you. How do I manifest that in the process of tawaf? A. B. The process of tawaf should also remind us that this house of God in the physical realm is a correspondence to the house in the angelic realm known as Baytul Ma'mur, which is a reflection of the Arsh. Inasmuch as the angels circumambulate in that realm, O oh Lord, I wish to resemble, to become similar to the lifestyle of angels. Angels have been describing the Quran. Ibadun mukramuna la yasbiqunahu bil qawli wa hum bi amrihi ya'malun. They are psychic, spiritual 
entities, the angels, whose consciousness is possessed by the knowledge of the perfection of their Lord to such an extent then that they are then in total obedience and Allah therefore has selected them to be agents to carry out His will. They've got no desire of their own. They're in total obedience to God. In Tawaf, I am practicing the process of becoming angelic, of subjugating my desires to the will of God. No. Even beyond that, the Quran, chapter 22, Surah Al Hajj, says that after you have sacrificed your animal, in Mina that is, then proceed and perform Hajj, the Tawaf al Hajj. It uses a particular characterization of the house of God, which is very important. Go and make tawaf of the bait which is atiq, of the house which is atiq. Atiq is derived from the root word irtiq, which means emancipation. This house is liberated. It's emancipated. It's got no authority ruling over it. O oh Lord, step by step, I am making tawaf around a house which is a symbol of freedom from any power or political authority other than the one validated by God. Karbala manifests each of these lessons which have acquired in Hajj. Hajarul Aswad, we're supposed to swear allegiance. It's as if it's the hand of God that you shake on the earth. When you reach the Hajarul Aswad, if you cannot go and touch and kiss it, from a distance, pay your respect and recite this dua. Amantu billah. I declare that in this entire universe, I believe there is a creator. I don't think so. This universe is mechanical, meaningless, blind, random. Amantu billah. Not only that, and I also make kufr. I'm a kafir. You declare your kufr there. Kafartu. بِالْجِبْتِ وَالطَّاغُوتِ وَاللَّاتِ وَالْعُزَّى وَعِبَادَةِ الشَّيْطَانِ وَعِبَادَةِ كُلِّ نِدٍ يُدْعَ مِنْ دُونِ اللَّهِ I declare that I'm a kafir to anyone who claims power other than God. Yazid, Ubaidullah ibn Ziyad, Omar al-Sa'ad, you cannot have any power over me. Hajj has trained me. 25 times I went there. I declared my allegiance and my obedience to God and God alone. And then you go and pray behind Maqam Ibrahim. The ayah says, وَاتَّخِذُ مِن مَكَانِ إِبْرَاهِيمَ مُصَلَّى You should go and pray at Maqam Ibrahim. The riwayah says, of course, you cannot pray at the Maqam. What you should do is you should keep it in front of you. You pray behind. Physically, you pray behind. Spiritually, that is your Imam. Ibrahim becomes my Imam. Which Ibrahim? The iconoclast. The one who smashed the idols when the community went out to worship. Ibrahim, the one who brought his family and deposited them in Mecca. Ibrahim who sacrificed whatever he had for the sake of God. Ibrahim is my Imam. And I'm praying behind Maqam Ibrahim. And then you proceed for Safa and Marwa. The ayah says, Surah Baqarah, Inna Safa wal Marwata min Allah. The symbols of worship are these two mounts of Safa and Marwa. It's mustahab. The Prophet did that when he arrived at Safa. He made a dua. Look at the training. Look at the disciplining. You look at the preparation for sacrifice. You declare at Safa, La ilaha illallah, wahdahu, wahdahu, wahdah. O oh Lord, I declare that in this entire universe there is no power who deserves to be 
recognized, to be adored, to be praised, to be loved, to be obeyed, to be submitted to other than you. Wahdahu. You are alone in all the actions. There is no action possible in this world but what you will. Wahdahu. You are alone in your attributes. Your knowledge is unlimited. Everyone else is ignorant. Wahdahu. You are alone in your essence. In that level, you are singular. Anjaza wa'da wa nasara abda wa hazam al ahzab wa'da. He is the one who promised support for anyone who sacrifices himself in the way of God. Did not the Prophet receive divine support in Badr and in Uhad and on all the battles right up till Tabuk? The Prophet went and declared that at Safa. You begin in the name of God, Allahu Akbar, La ilaha illallah, alhamdulillah, subhanallah, and you proceed towards Marwa. I begin in the name of God, I end in the name of God, I move every step in the name of God. You think Omar ibn Sa'd is going to intimidate me? You think Ubaidullah ibn Ziyad can buy me? You think Shimr ibn Dhil Jawshan can give me some sort of immunity? I am devoted to God and God alone. Having completed Safa and Marwa, the next process in the Hajj is to go for Arafah. It's interesting, Arafah Arafa is not in the Haram. Arafah is outside the Haram. The guest of God who has come for Hajj, before he can begin Hajj at Tamattu, he's been asked to wear the Ihram of Hajj and please, please leave my precincts. Go out. Haram, which is bounded in the north by Tan'im, and the west by Hudaybiyah, and the south by Juhfa, and the west by Arafah. You leave the precincts of Haram. Go and stand outside the Haram and perform two tasks. Recognize who your Lord is. Engage in communication with your Lord and confess. Admit to your sins. Begin the process of purification all over again. Having completed Arafah, it's interesting we should discuss sometime the dua that was recited by Imam Hussein in Arafah. You then come to Mash'arul Haram. Remember God in Mash'arul Haram. Consolidate. That's the second gate of entrance now. The first gate at Arafah. Second gate at Mash'arul Haram. Consolidate and spiritually experience whatever communication and confession that you made to God at Arafah. Arm yourself with ammunition. You have a shaitan to fight. When you reach Mina, one of the first tasks you're supposed to perform is to throw pebbles. It's important, we need to recognize that shaitan is not physical. He's not perce perceptible to, to our physical senses. And therefore that pillar is not shaitan. And therefore the stones that I throw will not remove any shaitan. So the significance of those pebbles is A, I fully recognize that shaitan is not physical. Incidentally, sometimes shaitan can be so smart that he can make us believe that we are fighting him when in fact we're fighting God. He can make us believe that we are saying A'udhu Billahi Minash Shaitan when in fact it is A'udhu Bish Shaitani Minallah. Observe. In the Battle of Jamal, the lady who led the expedition before she began the battle in following the seerah of the Holy Prophet, she took a, a handful of sand and she sprinkled it on the other side and she recited this ayah of the Quran which says, وَمَا رَمَيْتَ إِذْ رَمَيْتَ وَلَكِنَّ اللَّهَ رَمَى The Holy Prophet in his own battles used to do that. O oh Lord, 
I've got a small band of followers. I've got this huge army of enemy. But we believe in you. We want to advance your cause. Please help us. After that dua, he used to sprinkle the dust. Allah sent this ayah down. وَمَا رَمَيْتَ إِذْ رَمَيْتَ وَلَكِنَّ اللَّهَ رَمَى Oh Prophet, you did not throw the dust when you threw. You did not throw the spears. You did not use the spears. The, the sword, you did not throw the stones when you did it. It was God who was doing it. You were agents, you were instruments in God's hands because you submitted yourself to Him. That lady did the same thing. She picked up the sand and she sprinkled. Imam Ali salam replied, وَمَا رَمَيْتِ إِذْ رَمَيْتِ وَلَكِنَّ الشَّيْطَانَ رَمَى When you threw, it wasn't you throwing it was shaitan making you throw. You can go to Jamaratul Aqaba and throw as many pebbles as you want. But if you don't do it right, shaitan is making you do it. And you think you have hit the shaitan. If we realize A, shaitan is not physical. B, we recognize that the way he influences us is mentally. C, we remind ourselves that human beings have been created with the superior power to be able to understand when shaitan attacks. Four, that we have the willpower if we can muster it. We have the willpower to say no. And he goes away. He goes away. The shaitan has been described in the Quran to be khannas. Min sharril. Waswasil khannas. Khannas in the Arabic language is described for a particular position where a person takes one foot in advance and the other foot is behind. He wants to launch, but if you resist, he's ready to run away. He's khannas. If I remind myself that yes, I have an enemy, I have the power to know which is the right thought and the wrong thought too. Three, I have the power to make the decision to say no. Four, I've made that determination. If shaitan were to appear as a physical being, you know what I would do? Allahu Akbar! And that's when you throw the seven pebbles. As an expression of that inner determination to defeat shaitan with God's grace. And of course, the next item in Hajj is the sacrifice. In following the seerah of Prophet Ibrahim, expressing the readiness that oh lord whatever i have i admit it's not mine it's given by you it's a gift it's a it's an amana and i'm ready to use it for your sake you have appreciated now to what extent hajj can potentially train an individual step by step to focus and direct all his energies toward god to reach a point of self-discipline and sacrifice that then he is ready and willing to give up whatever he has for God's sake. 25 times Imam Hussein performed Hajj. Interestingly enough, two years before the death of Muawiyah, just like what the Prophet did in the last years of his life, he sent a public declaration, the Prophet is going for Hajj. Uh, more than a hundred thousand people turned out for that farewell Hajj. Imam Hussein, two years before Muawiyah's death in the year 58, also sent out a message that I'm going for Hajj. Almost a thousand people were specifically invited, 200 of whom were companions, almost 800 of whom, of the thousand who attended, were the followers of the companions, the second generation. And incidentally, there were ladies. Imam Hussein specifically also invited ladies in that gathering. In the gathering in Mina, Imam gave a long speech, but if we can summarize it, there were three main themes. Number one, he talked about the authority, the righteous authority that was granted to Imam Ali. By God, he told them, tell me, is it not true that when the Prophet arrived in Medina, he forged and bonded brotherhood between himself and Imam Ali? Tell me by God, is it not true that by God's instruction the Prophet closed all doors of entry towards the mosque except the door of Imam Ali? 
Tell me by God what happened in Ghadir. Tell me by God what the Prophet said in Mubahila. Tell me by God what the Prophet said in Khaybar. Tell me by God. And he went on. That's phase one of his speech. Whereby he draws confession. You're the companions. You're the followers of the companions. You do realize the righteous Khalifa. One. Two. Is it not true that God has given us a duty to establish virtue by speech? If necessary, then by action. If necessary, by our lives. And we have to eliminate vice with all these three steps. Three, you are not ordinary people. You are people who enjoy respect in society. If you enjoy privileges, if you have certain rights, well, let me remind you, you have responsibilities. God is going to question you on the day of judgment. How could you tolerate injustices? You know what the oppressor is doing. You see that. And then towards the end of that khutbah, he says, it is your duty, go back and inform each and every one that you meet about this speech. And then he makes a dua which summarizes and epitomizes the purpose of his uprising. Allahumma innaka ta'lamu annahu lam yakun illathi ma kana minna munafasatan fi sultan. O oh Lord, you know that I am not making this uprising because I want wealth, because I want power. My purpose is, is to establish godly values. My purpose is to help the oppressed. My purpose is to implement the godly laws. This was Hussein using Hajj as a center where people came from all over the Islamic world and he propagated his mission. In the 60th year of Hijrah, unfortunately, Hussein had to leave just on the day when people were proceeding for Hajj. As he took that long and slow route from Mecca onwards, drifting almost toward Kufa, one of the individuals who was not yet a companion was Zuhair bin Qayn al-Bajali. Zuhair belonged to the camp of the Uthmanis. He was returning back from Hajj. The caravans were almost moving parallel, but somehow they were trying to avoid each other. At a point where Imam Hussein's caravan would move, he would stop. When Imam stops, his caravan would then move. Somehow he wanted to keep a distance. He didn't belong to that camp. He belonged to the camp of the Uthmanis. Yet at one point, between Khuzaymiyyah and Thalabiyyah, at a point known as Zarud, Imam sends a message. They just happen, happen to stop at the same point. Imam sends a messenger to the camp of Zuhair. The messenger comes and says, Imam says, Alqini ukallimuka. Please come over. I would like to discuss with you. I don't even belong to that camp. The reaction was that of surprise. They were suddenly silent. The wife, amazing. The woman, Dilham, Dilham bint Amr, she cries out. She says, Subhanallah, Ibn Rasulillah, Ba'atha ilayka fala tujibu. The son of the Prophet has invited you, and you are hesitating in responding to him. Amazing, sometimes women can be sharper and smarter and quicker in responding to the truth. It reminds me of the, the incident of uh, the wife of Fir'aun. Surah Tahrim, chapter 66, toward the end, Allah says, ضَرَبَ اللَّهُ مَثَلًا لِلَّذِينَ آمَنُوا إِمْرَأَةَ Fir'aun." Allah gives a role model to the believers. For women? No. To the believers. To the men and the women, of course. And the role model is a woman, the wife of Fir'aun. You know when? إِذْ قَالَتْ رَبِّ بْنِ لِي بَيْ عِنْدَكَ بَيْتًا فِي الْجَنَّةِ 
وَنَجِّنِي مِنْ فِرْعَوْنَ وَعَمَلِهِ وَنَجِّنِي مِنَ الْقَوْمِ الظَّالِمِينَ O oh Lord, my aspiration is, I want to get near you. And of course, once I'm near you, give me Jannah also. First, I want neighborhood. And then I want the place. And then I want the house. O oh Lord, save me and protect me from Fir'aun and his henchmen. O oh Lord, rescue me from the oppressors and unjust people. Women sometimes can be in leading roles. Zuhair is prompted. He rushes over to the camp of Imam Hussein. Unfortunately, history here is silent. Something happens in that camp. They meet, they talk, and Zuhair comes out, but he comes out a changed man. I want to, I want to allow me to analyze the journey that Zuhair now begins as a process of Tawbah, which we discuss. Tawbah, we said, everyone is undergoing a journey, and we have to develop a mindset, a lifestyle. And one of the lifestyles being suggested in the Quran is Tawbah. Look at the process of Tawbah being practiced by Zuhair. Allow me to categorize his process into four stages. Stage number one is conversion. He, he shifts from a position of opposition and he comes to a position of support for Imam Hussein. In Sarafa, wa ashraqa wajhu, he came back happy. He came back a changed man. He came back and said, woman, I don't want to put you into trouble, I've decided to join. And the end result is death. I don't want you to suffer. According to one narration, he released her. You can go back home. According to other narration, the woman said, how can you go to the son of Mustafa and I should not go to the daughter of Murtava? He even told the other companions, you have a choice. The end result is martyrdom, but I've made my decision question what is it that in the process of conversion pulled Zuhair out of his lifestyle of being a supporter of Uthmanis and made him a Husseini we don't know the history is silent what took place there but one reality about Tawbah is very clear and that is as I mentioned last night the ayah in Surah Tawbah says, remember the case of those three who refused to participate in Tabuk and the Prophet came back and he boycotted them and they started suffering pressure from outside from the community and pressure from inside, but God did not accept them as yet. Tawbah became possible when they reached that point of recognition, O oh Lord, I now have no place to run away from your displeasure, but back to you to seek your pleasure at that moment Allah says Allah turned toward them and lifted them up Allah is always because he's all loving because he's all merciful because he's all caring because he loves us more than we love ourselves every moment each one of us is being called back come back make Tawbah the sun shines every day. The moon is bright all the time. The day and the night cycle keep on repeating itself. So what? The process of inspiration in as much as the sun and the moon and the night and the day is continuous. God is talking to me and you even now. Question, do we have an ear to listen with? Or are we so trapped in our distractions that God's invitation is being ignored? Zuhair underwent the process of conversion. His responsiveness, his receptiveness, his readiness to say yes happened to be at the right level. Process one, conversion. Process two, now Zuhair begins to contribute. He was an expert in warfare. 
Notice I said yesterday when Hur intercepted and obstructed the progress of the caravan. With the moment they saw the army coming, Imam Hussein said we need to take a defensive position. It's Zuhair who looked around and pointed a place. This is a place which is appropriate. It is Zuhair also, given his military experience, at a point when Imam Hussein declared in his khutbah, I will not submit to Ubaidullah ibn Ziyad. And yet, Hur said, but I'm under instructions. I have to deflect you and redirect you and deliver you to Ubaidullah ibn Ziyad. You know what you want, Zuhair advises Imam Hussein? He says, this is the time. We better strike them. There are just a thousand. I'm sure we can win them over. It's going to be easier now before reinforcements come. Consultation. Imam, of course, does not accept that. Imam's vision, Imam's values were much more wider than Zuhair possibly could have. Imam says, Ma kuntu li abda'ahum bil qital. My principle is I never begin combat. I will not initiate the battle. The process of return began with conversion, continued with contribution and consultation. Yet a third level, Zuhair manifests his process of return back to Allah, the process of tawbah, the commitment to the cause. Remember the eve of Ashura? This is the end of the story now, Imam says. I'm paraphrasing. The enemy wants me and me alone. They're after my blood. They don't want you. You're free. Please go away. Leave me alone. You're free. We all know the overwhelming response of the companions. The expression of their loyalty. The expression of their love. Zuhair is one of those individuals who has been recorded in history to, to say, La Allah, I swear by God that will never happen. La Wallahi la yakunu zalik. Atruku ibn Rasulillah wa anju ana. Can I ever imagine a situation where I save myself, I become safe and sound, and I abandon the son of the Prophet? La Allah, la yakunu zalik. La arani Allahu dhalika al-yawm. May I never live to see that day when the concern for my own comfort is more than that of my leader whom I've accepted. The process of return toward perfection, towards tawbah, began with conversion, continued with contribution, reached a point of expression of commitment and dedication and devotion. And finally, stage four, was the confrontation and the campaign in the battle. On the day of Ashura, imagine, just a few days ago, he was an outsider. On the day of Ashura, Imam appoints Zuhair to be the head of the contingent that was on the right, the Maimana, inasmuch as Maisara was given to Habib bin Mazahir, and the central portion of the army was given to Abbas. Zuhair fights, and the fighting continues till up to Zuhur. Imam says, please stop the fight. They refuse to give him respite to pray. Sa'id bin Abdullah Hanafi says, I will protect you. Zuhair was the second person who stood up to protect. They prayed Salatul Khawf. Sa'id collapses. Zuhair continues. He then enters the battlefield. In the battlefield, it's amazing. He was an outsider. He was one of them. But he began his process of tawbah. And then he admonishes them. I never invited this man. I never sent him letters. I never expressed any promises of support. But I know he's the son of the prophet. There is no man on this earth other than him who is the son of the daughter of the prophet. I've recognized who's the true, who's the true man. They rejected him. They ignored him. They made mockery of him. Till Imam Hussein then sends a messenger, tells him, Zuhair, Imam says you have done enough. I don't think so. I don't think so. You have fallen short than the contribution and the admonishment and the guidance that was given by the Mu'min of Ali Fir'aun. 
having reached a point where no longer any guidance could elicit a response, Zuhair launches the attack. Ana Zuhair wa Ana ibn al -Qain. If you don't know me, I'm Zuhair, I'm the son of Qain. Ana Zuhair, Ana ibn al -Qain. Azudukum bisayfi an Hussein. I swear I'm going to use my sword and repel you away from Hussein. You know why? Inna al Hussein ahadu sibbatain. Because I believe Hussein is one of the grandsons of the Prophet. You know which Prophet? Min itratil barri taqiyya zain. He is from that family which is pure, which is pious, which is perfect. You have questions why I've come here to fight against you? Well, let me tell you. This family represents, represents purity, represents perfection, represents piety. Well, God has created me and every other human being in such a way that we love purity and perfection and piety. I have accepted it. I have submitted it. I have dedicated my life. Ana Zuhair wa ana ibn al-Qayn adhudukum bisayfi an al Hussein. Which Hussein? In al Hussein, ahadu sibtain min itrat al bar al taqiy al zain. Ya leet al nafsi qusimat qismain. Oh Lord, oh Lord, I'm going to fight, and I'm going to fight till the end. And let me tell you, I am ready to be chopped up into pieces for the sake of Allah. Zuhair collapses, finally. One of those few individuals for whom Imam Hussein rushes to the battlefield is Zuhair. We don't have all the details that he spoke, but the few words that Imam Hussein spoke to Zuhair. La yabu'adannaka Allah. Zuhair, may Allah not deprive you of his special mercy. You have done enough in the way of God. Allahu qatilik. Your enemies, may Allah deprive them of His special mercy. You know why? Because these enemies never recognize that you fought for purity and piety and perfection. Allahu qatilik. Allahna musikhu qiradatan wa khanazir. And the denial and the deprivation of God's special mercy on these people should be such, just like the way those people were punished and transmogrified from humans into pigs into apes. Why? Because when the human being abandons his faculty of appreciating purity and piety and perfection, he's as good as an animal, if not worse. Assalamu alaikum. يا أبا عبد الله وعلى الأرواح التي حلت بفنائك وأنا خت برحلك عليكم منا جميعا سلام الله ما بقينا وبقي الليل والنهار والسلام عليكم ورحمة الله ما تمحسن